So as someone who researches black holes and how they grow and what their effects are, this meme spoke to me on just a whole other <laughs> level. I discovered it back in my meme review from a couple of months ago. And I know from the comments that loads of you loved it as well. So I wanna make sure that everybody appreciates what is the best buff SpongeBob meme of all time as much as I do. So today, let's go through the five different types of black holes, how they form and how they're different. Because yeah, there's five different types. There's one missing from this meme. So let's start at the very beginning with primordial black holes. Now a black hole is a region of space where you've packed so much material into it that you've made it so dense that the pull of gravity is so strong that you would have to be traveling faster than the speed of light to escape that pull of gravity. Physics says it's not possible to travel faster than the speed of light. So there's this point of no return, at which point if you cross that point in space, you're not gonna be able to escape the pull of that black hole. Now that doesn't have to be billions of kilograms of worth of material to do that. You can do it with just a few micrograms of material if you pack them densely enough together. There will still be that point of no return where you'd have to be traveling faster than the speed of light to escape it. This is what we think happened in the very early universe, you know, right after the Big Bang, where matter as we know it hasn't really formed yet. And you've just got this huge big soup of particles that can start clumping together just randomly. And then you've got one area that's slightly more dense than the regions around it. So then they start attracting other things under gravity. And eventually when a region gets to even just 10% higher in density than the region around it, it can collapse into one of these primordial black holes that are no bigger than the width of a human hair that are even just a couple of micrograms of matter. Now it was Stephen Hawking who worked out the theory behind this and how they could possibly form in the early universe, but they're still technically hypothetical because we've never observed a black hole that small before, unsurprisingly. But it's led many people to speculate, well, if they are that small and that hard to see, then that sounds a little bit like dark matter, this matter that we know makes up 90% of all the matter in the universe, but doesn't interact with light, it only interacts with gravity. Maybe that could be primordial black holes. There's a lot of research studies on this and the jury really is still out on whether that is the case or not. I've made a video before that again, I'll link up in the cards and down in the video description if you want to know more. Also to do with primordial black holes, back in 2019, a research study came out that suggested there could be a tennis ball sized primordial black hole in the solar system orbiting way out on the edge. This is my favorite primordial black hole theory by far. I so desperately want the solar system to have its own little pet black hole. All right, moving from the hypothetical to the actual, to stellar mass black holes. And this is the type of black hole that you probably have heard of before. These ones form when a massive star runs out of fuel to keep it burning and giving off light and energy. So essentially there's no force to counteract gravity pulling inwards on all the stuff in the star and the star goes supernova. Now a star like the sun won't do this. It's not massive enough. You need to start with a star that's at least 20 times the mass of the sun, if not up to like hundreds of times of the mass of the sun. And the majority of that is actually hydrogen and it doesn't all collapse down into a black hole. The hydrogen around the outside actually rebounds off the inner core and that's what you get in terms of a supernova and you see those really cool nebula remnants with these big shells of gas around them. Right in the middle though is the core of the star and that's what can't resist that crush of gravity inwards and it collapses down into a black hole hole, which is anywhere from around about three-ish times the mass of the sun to tens of times of the mass of the sun. This is where they get their name from, stellar mass black hole. They're black holes that are around about the same mass as stars. It's just that they're incredibly, incredibly dense, which is what's made them into a black hole. And unlike the hypothetical primordial black holes, we've actually observed a lot of these stellar mass black holes in lots of different ways as well. For example, if the star that collapsed was in a binary system, i.e. it was orbiting another star, then the black hole can actually start to pull material off the other star. It can feed off it. That material starts to speed up when it spirals around the black hole. It heats up and it starts to glow in X-rays, which we can then detect 
all over our galaxy, the Milky Way. We've also detected gravitational waves, these ripples through space that are caused by some cataclysmic event like the merger of two black holes. So with the LIGO and the Virgo detector, we've managed to be able to detect two black holes merging to give us even something up to a hundred times the mass of the sun. And we can also detect these stellar mass black holes when they pass in front of background stars. And they essentially act as like a, a gravity lens, bending light around them to briefly brighten that background star. If you can spot that star briefly brightening in a certain way, then you know what you've detected is a stellar mass black hole passing in front of that star. All right, moving on to the objects that have my heart now, super massive black holes. These are the black holes that are in the very centers of galaxies, in the gravitational driving seat, if you will. And they can be anywhere from a million times the mass of the sun to hundreds of billions of times the mass of the sun. Now there's lots of debate about how these supermassive black holes actually form or how they get that big. Did a galaxy of stars form first? One of those stars go supernova and become a stellar mass black hole, which then grew from there to become the heaviest thing in the galaxy and it sank to the center where it was in this gravitational driving seat and grew to be a supermassive black hole. Or did the black hole form first in the very early universe? In kind of the same way as primordial black holes did, except you have a really big giant gas cloud that completely skips turning into stars altogether and just collapses straight down into being a supermassive black hole. And then you have the galaxy of stars forming around it. I like to call this the astrophysics chicken or the egg, and there's still no real consensus about it. Although we're hoping that the James Webb Space Telescope will help us to answer that. What it means though is that right now as we sit here, as the Earth orbits the Sun, the Sun orbits the very center of the Milky Way, which is a supermassive black hole four million times the mass of the Sun. We know that because we've spent decades studying the positions of the stars in the very center of the Milky Way. So while the sun takes about 250 million years to make one orbit around the center, we've already seen the closest star to the black hole in the center make one full orbit in just 12 years, traveling at a whopping 8% of the speed of light. Now, by studying the orbits of all those individual stars, so how fast they're moving and how long it takes them to complete an orbit, we can use the laws of gravity to essentially reconstruct how heavy the thing is that they're orbiting around. And that's how we get at that number, that four million times the mass of the sun. Something that massive in a space smaller than the solar system that we don't get any light from can only be a supermassive black hole. And we now think there's a supermassive black hole in the center of every single galaxy in the universe. I've made another video on how we know that before, which I'll link up here and in the video description below. We even managed to take an image of one of these supermassive black holes back in 2019 using the Event Horizon telescopes, which looks in radio waves. This is a supermassive black hole in the galaxy M87. And you can essentially see the gas spiraling around the black hole that's been heated to these huge temperatures so that it glows. And then you can see that shadow of the black hole in the middle where we're no longer getting any more light. All right, now we're taking supermassive black holes and we're turning them up to 11 to get a quasar. So remember how the black hole in the center of M87 has this gas spiraling around it that heats up and starts to glow so that we can see it and know that it's there. Well, if you keep chucking material into that region around the black hole, that disk of material that's spiraling around it that will eventually be eaten by the black hole and, and used to grow the mass of the black hole, that'll just keep getting bigger and brighter and brighter and brighter until it starts giving off things like X-rays and radio waves and UV so that they are so, so bright that sometimes they even become the brightest objects in the entire universe. They're so bright that in some cases we can see this light that's being given off from the gas spiraling around the supermassive black hole, but it's in a galaxy so distant that the light from its stars is too faint to see. And they end up just looking like, well, incredibly bright stars themselves because all you can see is that incredibly bright radiation coming from this point in the middle. Hence how they got their name. They were originally referred to as quasi-stellar objects, i.e 
almost star-like, which eventually over the years and decades was portmanteaued to give you the word quasar. And astronomers back when they were sort of first detecting quasars had no idea what they were. They had no idea that what they were seeing was essentially an incredibly greedy black hole that was taking in all this material and it was glowing incredibly brightly so that we could see it. But it really did give us that piece of the puzzle that we needed to figure out that at the center of every single galaxy, whether it's actively growing so that we can actually see it from the light that's spiraling around it or not, there is a supermassive black hole. So now onto that fifth type of black hole that was missing from our original SpongeBob meme, the intermediate mass black holes. And the clue is in the name, really, they sit in that mass gap between stellar mass black holes at three to tens of times the mass of the sun and supermassive black holes at millions to hundreds of billions of times the mass of the sun. So they're anywhere from hundreds to hundreds of thousands of times the mass of the sun. Problem is that we've never found any black holes of that mass before. We have a lot of candidates, but nothing concrete that's directly been measured. But we assume that they have to exist, or they must have existed at some point in the universe's history, because how else would have supermassive black holes gotten that big if they didn't grow through that region that you would class as an intermediate mass black hole? Now there's also a correlation between the mass of the black hole at the center of the galaxy to the mass of the galaxy itself. So in less massive dwarf galaxies, we think there might be intermediate mass black holes in the center. The problem is we don't have any way to confirm that. We have no direct way of measuring the mass of the black hole. We would either need to observe the stars orbiting around the center of the galaxy like we did in the Milky Way, except these galaxies are much further away and you can't resolve individual stars to do that or you would need gas to start falling into the black hole and the black hole to start to actually grow and that material, you know, start to heat up and go so that we can see it. And then you can measure a mass from that as well from how fast that material is moving. But then the problem is these black holes are much smaller. And so when that material does start to fall in, it doesn't get up to as high speeds, So it doesn't glow as brightly. So they're a lot fainter. And so they're a lot harder to see. But despite being very difficult to do, astronomers did manage to do this for the most nearby faintest growing black hole in the middle of NGC 4395. And in it, they measured an intermediate mass black hole of 360,000 times the mass of the sun. It's about 10 times less massive than the Milky Way's black hole. Now, if you're being pedantic, you could argue that that was just like the tail end of the supermassive black hole distribution. Just like how when LIGO announced recently they detected gravitational waves from the mergers of two stellar mass black holes that gave you a remnant black hole of 142 times the mass of the sun, which you would technically class as an intermediate mass black hole. But again, you could also argue that it was just the tail end of the stellar mass black hole distribution. So what about black holes that are truly intermediate mass black holes? Something that's like a thousand to 10,000 times the mass of the sun, right smack bang in the middle of that intermediate mass black hole mass regime. Well, the best place we can think to look for those is globular clusters of stars. Groups of over hundreds of thousands of stars that have all formed in the same place from the same cloud of gas at the same time. And for a long time, people have speculated whether these globular clusters could have intermediate mass black holes in the very center, kind of like mini galaxies, or just whether, you know, enough stars have already gone supernova and become stellar mass black holes themselves. And because the globular clusters are so, so dense, they've already merged together and become an intermediate mass black hole. Now, there's been lots of claims over the years of intermediate mass black holes. For example, in 2002, astronomers claimed to have found evidence for a 2,000 times the mass of the sun black hole in a globular cluster called G1. But just a year later, in 2003, a new study of the movements of all the stars in that cluster came out and claimed that there was no evidence for an intermediate mass black hole whatsoever. Now that scenario for finding evidence of an intermediate mass black hole and then finding evidence that contradicts that has been a regular pattern in this field. In fact, just last month, another candidate intermediate mass black hole was found after it supposedly passed in front of the radiation from a gamma ray burst. 
Now you might already have seen the video that Anton Petro made on his channel on this discovery just a few weeks ago. If not, go check that out. Thing is, this is a highly uncertain measurement though, because it depends on the distance of the gamma ray burst and the distance to the intermediate mass black hole. So I'm not convinced yet. I'm not getting my hopes up too much, at least until further work has been done confirming or opposing this result because I've been burned before. So until we actually do confirm their existence, I think we're justified in leaving intermediate mass black holes out of the SpongeBob meme for now anyway. But when that day comes, do not doubt that I am prepared. I have already selected the image of SpongeBob that I can use to represent intermediate mass black holes. So I can just insert it into the buff SpongeBob meme. So bring it on universe. I'm ready. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to take a minute to thank this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that gets you to learn by doing, the way that I've always found that I learn best. Brilliant has a huge range of courses on all areas of science and maths that are fun and interactive, and they take you through new concepts step by step. There's no tests or exams, just learn at your own pace. Now, if you wanna know more about which stars are massive enough to become black holes and which stars don't become black holes, check out their course on stellar remnants, which takes you through all the possibilities for when a star dies. So if that sounds like something you want to give a go and you want to support me and my channel, then head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, and sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant. And now, roll those bloopers. Now by studying the orbits of all... Flynn and supermassive black holes at million to hundreds of billions of times the mass of the sun, they sit right back smang in the middle. Black hole number five. One, two, three, four, five. Everybody in the black hole, come on in, jump. So that scenario of finding evidence for an intermass black hole, an intermass black hole. That's not the right word. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. 